There was a second effect, however. You think the current fiscal stimulus is big. Right now, government spending went up from about 20 to about 25% of GDP. But in World War II, government spending in the United States went from 10% of GDP to 50% of GDP. And when it came down at the end of the war, it didn't come back to 10%, it came down to 20% and stayed there. So one of the effects of the huge fiscal stimulus in World War II was a permanent increase in the size of government. Um, one of the things that concerns me about the current fiscal stimulus is I don't think it's going to be going down again at the end of, uh, at the, end of the recession, if and ever we see an end to this recession. Uh, I think that many of the, of the policies that have been introduced are, are going to be new long-term permanent uh, programs that will see an increase in the size of government. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, don't, I, don't, dis I, I don't think that... Uh, I, I'm, not a person who, I'm, I'm not a person who believes in zero government. Uh, I'm, I'm not a libertarian, I'm not an anarchist, I think governments have important functions. But I think that the reasons for introducing new government programs should be separated from uh, the reasons for temporary uh, changes in economic activity to help, uh, to help us through recessions. Uh, I'm worried that that may not be happening right now. Okay, um, so I've taken you through classical economics, and uh, I've taken you through the introduction of Keynesian economics, but many economists gave up on Keynesian economics in the 1970s. And why was that? Well, a lot of it had to do with uh, the fact that Keynes, when Keynes wrote his, his main book in 1936, the general theory of employment, interest, and money, inflation was not a very pressing issue. It was, a, it was a period of stable or even falling prices during the Great Depression. And Keynes's book, uh, although widely regarded as one of the most important books of the 20th century, is extremely difficult to read, internally coherent, and doesn't, incoherent, and doesn't say very much about inflation. And that led opened the door for a lot of uh, post-war economists to try and interpret what he'd said. Now, one of those interpreters was a New Zealand economist called Bill Phillips. He's known for two things. One, if you ever get to London and go to the Science Museum, there's a, a wonderful example of an analog computer that Bill Phillips built. He built five or ten of them. You can't really see it in this picture, but it was full of colored water and pipes, and it represented the economy. And, and he would give demonstrations of water flowing through pipes to illustrate what it meant to conduct fiscal policy or monetary policy. Uh, again, you can see that uh, in London. But more importantly, he was known for establishing what for a while was thought of as a fact. And that fact was that you could either have high inflation and low unemployment, or, or uh, low inflation and high unemployment, but not both. And what I'm showing you here is, is two pieces uh, of evidence for that fact from the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s. And uh, for a number of years after the Second World War, economists thought of this as, as a as a fundamental law of economics, there was a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Uh, two American economists who helped try to push that idea, Paul Samuelson, who just died recently, and, and Bob Solow, both in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, they wrote an influential paper that argued government policy can choose either high inflation or high unemployment, but not both. And they based their ideas on uh, a theory that came out of Keynes's book, The General Theory. So the Keynesians argued and believed strongly that before you could get inflation in the economy, you'd have to get back to full employment. So first you get full employment, the economy is running at capacity, only then can, can prices start rising. Uh, uh, Solo and Samuelson then argued that there's a trade-off. And as an article of public policy, they argued government should try to decide where you'd like to be in that trade-off. 
Did you want to have the economy functioning at a high level with, with a little bit of inflation? Or would you accept a little bit more unemployment in order to have less inflation? And then uh, the 70s hit us. And notice this is that same trade-off between inflation and unemployment that had appeared to be very stable in the, 40s and in the 50s and 60s. But in the 70s uh, uh, and the 80s, the, the curve completely disappeared. And we started seeing very high employment, unemployment and very high inflation at the same time. And that was devastating to, to economic thought. It was a little bit like uh, set, trying, a little bit like getting uh, a, a bunch of NASA scientists together and sending a rocket to the moon and finding out they'd missed by uh, 100 miles because the gravitational constant had suddenly changed on them. So economists really did see the world in those terms. They thought that they'd established scientific facts that had the same validity as physical facts. And the disappearance of that uh, Phillips curve uh, was radical. And it led to a rethinking of classical ideas. There were two people uh, that I'm going to name here that were responsible for that. Both of them won the Nobel Prize. One is called Robert Lucas, uh, and the other is uh, Ed Prescott. And what they did is they went back and they took the classical ideas from the 1920s, remember the stable self-correcting system, and they formalized them with modern mathematics. Uh, they put together the ideas of Gerard de Breu, uh, the ideas of, uh, of Leon Voras, and uh, with modern interpreters of those ideas, in particular a Frenchman called uh, Gerard de Breu at Berkeley. And they ended up with a system that was formally uh, much more coherent than the verbal theories of Pigou, but were also much simpler. Because the, 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 the Pigovian system, Pigou's view of the world, the rocking horse view, had very rich sources of shocks. He never wrote down equations to describe them, but he had a very rich panoply of, of, of ideas about what generated business cycles. The reintroduction of classical thought in, in the 80s with uh, Lucas and, uh, and Prescott had very carefully written down mathematical equations, but uh, the cost of that was a much simpler theory of business cycles. Uh, one way that I like Willem Boyker at LSE describe the modern views is the economics of Dr. Pangloss, who, who is a, a character from Voltaire's Candide, uh, who says at one point, "'Tis demonstrated that things cannot be otherwise for since everything is made for an end, everything is necessarily for the best end. Candide replies, if this is the best of all possible worlds, what are the others? Now, that view that became dominant again in the 80s was a view that was now brought on board by economists who'd forgotten the Great Depression. They'd forgotten that things could go wrong. And they started seeing the classical world as if that's the one we lived in. I think that was very dangerous, and uh, that leads me to the last five minutes, in which I'll say a few things about current events. Where are we now? 